My name is Craig Labovitz. I am the CTO of the Nokia Deep Field Business Unit. And before that, about two years ago, I was the CEO and founder of Deepfield before the Nokia acquisition. And well before that, I've been working and writing about the evolving internet uh, for the last 20 years. In fact, starting out as a backbone engineer on the original National Science Foundation backbone. I've been fascinated on how the network is growing, changing, and evolving. And indeed, we'll spend some time, or at least I will, the next few minutes talking about some of these changes because the titanic market forces that are shaping and reshaping the, literally the foundation of how the network is built, of how the traffic flows, are of course having a significant impact on how Nokia thinks about the products and the solutions we're building. Certainly around analytics, around optimizing real-time peering and content engineering, and certainly around security. So I'll begin with what the internet looked like even five years ago. Five years ago, the internet looked like thousands of locations sending traffic, often over thousands of miles or hundreds of miles, traffic coming out of data centers on the West Coast to feed videos going to consumers in Europe or on the East Coast. But literally an internet that was made of thousands of networks traveling thousands of miles, when I started my career, we did traffic engineering once a quarter. We had really nice, predictable traffic demands. We'd decide we needed so many new circuits, and we called it a day. All of this, of course, is very different from the network today. We have gone from a network where traffic comes from thousands of locations that if you measure traffic in 100 providers and 100 different, uh, you know, dozens of different large enterprise, the traffic isn't coming from thousands of different companies. In fact, in just five companies, on average, you'll get to 50% of North American and European traffic. These companies being Netflix, Facebook, Google, Google Cloud, and others. This is not a network of thousands of endpoints. It's not a network where traffic is traveling thousands of miles. We're down to you know, hundreds of miles now in terms of data coming from really localized data centers and very dense peering interconnect in all of these locations. So radically different topology as you look at the numbers than even five years ago and certainly 10 years ago. But it's not just where the traffic is coming from is different. The vast majority of traffic now is adaptive bitrate. That means it is not these nice predictable traffic demands that you would do engineering once a quarter that in real time, all of the large CDN, all of the large content are using automated algorithms to do adaptive bitrate, where it is trying to achieve the highest bitrate it can. You have adaptive content, adaptive video. You have Google and others sloshing around gigabits, in some cases terabits of traffic, as they continue to try to optimize their own infrastructure, their own performance. If you are an enterprise traffic you know, engineer, network engineer today, Certainly if you're working for a large cable company or a you know, DSL provider, it is a very different time scale, very different type of traffic engineering than it was five years ago. And one of the key drivers behind this is just the absolute flood of traffic moving out of the enterprise into the large CDN. This is traffic we've been tracking, and by the way, if anyone really is into it, there's. Uh, a couple papers that go into lots of math and others tracking it, so you're, you're free to read that. But we've been tracking the growth of things like CDN, being Akamai, Level 3, EdgeCast. Back in 2009, a CDN, if you were an enterprise, was something you did to, as an adjunct to your network. You know, it was just 10, 20% of the network. Today, the CDN is the network. If you look at any large enterprise, any large consumer network, 80, 90% of traffic is all CDN based. Very different network than it was a few years ago. And the main thing driving this, of course, is cost. Certainly cost is important. But really why we're seeing this massive build out, this massive change of infrastructure is performance. You know, every second delay on a website transaction, every second delay on a video has measurable economic value today. So we're seeing game companies build out their own dark fiber to get ever closer to the consumer. We're seeing content move to the CDN. 
we're seeing ISPs spend huge amounts of money to try to optimize their Netflix rankings, all driven around achieving lower latency service and ultimately higher economic value. Of course, you know, all the advances in performance actually come with a sort of a double-edged sword. We used to have a nice, well-defined network where I could look at peering routers and go, aha, this is where I need to protect from DDoS. Today, we're seeing peering not just at a few locations, but we're seeing cloud exchanges, we're seeing dense peering, we're seeing the number of doorways interconnection with the rest of internet has grown by an order of magnitude over the last five years. Many more locations to protect where traffic is coming, uh, entering the network. And you can see this in some of the data, right? If you look at any vendor, all traffics kind of look uh, up and to the right, except, well, actually, the one on the right is down to the right. But DDoS traffic has been growing after a period of being flat for a while, <coughs> has been growing dramatically, largely driven by the combination of two beautiful things, IoT, and then gigabit or you know, file, uh, access to the home growing dramatically. You know, it used to be you had 10 meg and one compromised device in the home. Now you may have dozens of multiple compromised devices all at you know, gigabit speed. So an interesting combination. At the same time, too, most of the security technology uh, in the last you know, five years ago was all designed around spotting the fake traffic, the fake DDoS traffic out of the good traffic. Can you find the spoof, the synthetic traffic? You know, the traffic that's just a computer and compromised computer replaying streams of fake traffic, just spewing a recording. Today, of course, with IoT attacks we're seeing, it's not fake traffic. It is not 100 endpoints, it's tens of thousands of full stack TCP endpoints, all with legitimate, you know, brow with legitimate engines generating traffic, indistinguishable from the DDoS traffic of old. So very, very different sorts of security issues we're starting to see in the network, both where the DDoS attacks are coming from, as well as the nature of the DDoS traffic. So I'll end with this slide. All these trends are pretty remarkable. The internet is evolving faster in the last five years than I've ever seen it in the previous 25 years of my career. We'll talk about in the next couple of sessions how we're building traffic engineering products analytics products to try to provide the visibility and the tools for both enterprise and web scale to try to meet these engineering challenges. And other of my colleagues will spend some time talking about how we're addressing this new, much larger, changing, evolving security, uh, particularly DDoS, that we're seeing in the market. And I'll be around for questions, but I'll hand over now to my colleague, Jeff. Thank you. Hi guys, I'm uh, Jeff Sugimoto. I've been uh, in IP and networking uh, for over 20 years now. For the last 10 years, I've had the pleasure of leading the consulting engineering teams in North America, for, uh, focusing on service providers and large enterprise customers. What, uh, what Craig was talking about today uh, earlier was some pretty significant changes in internet, the traffic mixes, and how the industry's really adapted to change architectures and topologies to optimize on performance and cost for that. And I think <clears throat> from a networking perspective, which I think is near and dear to all of our hearts, I think there's some important implications of that. The first one is, it's just traffic engineering. I mean, put it simply, it's become more difficult. And I think that's because of the scale. Because what Craig was saying is that we no longer have one or two peering points in the world. We don't even have five or 10. We have customers now doing hundreds and in the extreme case, we've got a, a customer, a gaming customer that globally has over 2,000 peering points in the network. So just the sheer scale of the number of peering points and, uh, is, is affecting the complexity of doing traffic engineering. But even more importantly, I think there's a need to do more traffic engineering. We see much more content on the network that's sensitive to latency, that needs to uh, work around congestion. I mean, even if you set up your network on the optimal path, so your cache to your, to your eyeball is on the best path, we need to account for changes in latency, changes in congestion, cha failures in the network. So all that becomes more important in today's internet. And the problem with that, I think from a Nokia perspective, is that we haven't seen enough, I'll say, innovation to really fix this problem. And I'll give you a couple of examples. I mean, BGP is the peering protocol, everyone knows that, everyone loves that. 
But today, BGP doesn't do, it doesn't account natively for real-time performance, for real-time congestion. Those are obviously important if you're talking about traffic engineering. Visibility is another one. For, for years now, we, we kind of fly blind based on some uh, ASN information, BGP analytics to what's really going on to our network. But to really understand where things are coming in or going out of our network and get an application level view to do really fine traffic engineering, we need a leap in innovation. DDoS is another one, and Craig talked about this. Like Today, the PMO for DDoS is huge ACL filters, right? And then traffic may be redirected to a scrubbing center. I'm not, I have nothing against that. That works. But the observation we're making is that paradigm doesn't work for the future. To, to pay for the amount of scrubbing on a terabit attack is something not a lot of people are willing to do. So it works, but does it scale is the question. So what I want to do in the next session and my next uh, presentation here is talk about our solution, give you a brief overview. I'll talk about uh, some of the innovations we've had and introduce you to the key concepts. And I'll walk through some of the use cases that you'll see going through the, uh, through the rest of the day. So on the left-hand side here, I've got a very genericized network picture. It's not meant to look like anyone's network. It's meant to look like everyone's network at the same time. So we have content at the bottom, we got uh, some, some peering that may be transit or otherwise and some eyeballs at the top. What we're focusing on for this discussion is this border router, this peering router. And I think this makes sense when you're talking about content, getting your content out to your routers because for traffic that's leaving this network, egressing, this is the last place you're really controlling before that content gets to your eyeball. And it may be going through many clouds, many downstream hops, but this is where you're pushing it off. So this becomes an important place for outbound traffic. For inbound traffic, for service provider networks or anyone worried about inbound, obviously you want to control the link bandwidth here and how it gets to your network. So inbound is also a big part of this discussion. And also for inbound, this becomes the first line of defense for volumetric DDoS attacks. So we think this is a very strategic place to put something to protect yourselves. And I'll go through the use cases in a second, but I, what I want to do is introduce to you the framework of what we're providing to, to give these solutions. And I'll go through at a very high level, introduce you to each one of these pieces. Uh, in the next sessions, we're definitely going to go through all the details, and we've got demos set up to show all of this stuff working today. But we, we put this thing together to solve three problems. Number one was visibility, and this was fundamental uh, innovation we think we need for this space. The cloud intelligence and genome piece provide a application level view of what's happening on your network. So you're no longer dealing with ASN origins, you're no longer with C-flow records, you're not dealing with ASN path information. We've put uh, the innovation there to show you the exact application and multiple dimensions of what that, app, what that stream actually does. So that gives you unprecedented view on what's coming into your network and where it's happening. Also, from a visibility point of view, we're talking about border routers and taking advantage of innovations there, things like streaming telemetry. All the things that we needed that BGP didn't do, like the real-time performance data, congestion data, we're going to stream that into our, our analytics engine to provide that visibility. So we're, now we have a very rich set of data that we could do something with. What do we do? is we start controlling the network. And we have our SDN controller called the Network Services Platform, or NSP. And peering, I think, is one of these places in the network where automation could really help. I mean, it's complicated, and normally what today is you have a bunch of really smart engineers that you trust to make the changes. And you do that because fat fingering some problems there cause catastrophic outages on your internet. So we want to automate that and abstract that. And we're going to provide you options today, not to say, let Skynet do everything for you, right? Because some people are ready for that. We have customers who want that. But we also want to say, hey, we can abstract it and provide some policies so if this becomes much easier, but you're still in control as a human. So you're going to see that. And the last piece of this is, is the defender piece. Um, this is how we're going to do volumetric uh, DDoS prevention. And defender is the, uh, the detection, the software detection piece. And it's going to involve the border router down here as well. And I think this will become more clear when I walk through the use cases, which I'll do right now. So what we're going to show you today is if you notice that these things started animating. So we're going to show you some traffic engineering demos. So if we have traffic that's coming out and exiting through Pier 3 on this red path, we're going to show you very nice ways to identify that there's a problem with this link, 
and then move it over to Pier 2 because that was the better link. We're also going to show you, instead of moving it locally between red and green there, shifting all that traffic over to Pier 1, including uh, the path in the network over here. So that is done on congest detecting congestion. That's done on end-to-end -end latency from this point out to your end. So multiple options and ways to move traffic very easily. Uh, inbound on there as well, we're going to show, so inbound's a little bit harder to automate because we have bilateral agreements with your peering partners and everything, but we have an inbound solution also that takes, abstracts your network into slices so we can move traffic that's coming inbound here to over here very nicely. So we think that's a real differentiator. A lot of people, it's very hot to talk about EPE and egress engineering now. Inbound is much harder and we think we have a great solution there. Also in inbound, so everything I just talked about, sorry, is going to be in section two. So there's going to be a section following, and then the next section is going to show all those demos, and we're calling automated peering engineering demo. So that's section two. Section three is going to be about volumetric DDoS protection. And what we're talking about here is if these skull and crossbones are infected DDoS traffic, this is bad traffic coming in, what normally happens, the PMO is you drop huge ACL lists on here, you block the traffic, or you black hole the traffic, which is essentially completing the DDoS attack. If there's good traffic coming in here and you're black holing it, you're black holing everything. So what we want to do, or the other thing that you do is you have a redirect policy that goes, sends that uh, traffic to a scrubbing center, right? And that scrubbing center now cleans the traffic and re-injects it back into the network. This works, but what we're finding is that the economics of this solution and the, the scale of the solution doesn't work for a terabit attack. Nobody that I've talked to is going to sign a check for this much for a terabit worth of scrubbing. So what the innovation here is, is to change what we're doing here. And this is the first time that everything I've talked to up to this point has been multi-vendor. It, it, it works, our software works with every router. But for this particular case, we're using our own silicon called FP4. And what FP4 does, and we have a whole section on it coming up, is removes this scrubbing center functionality from this external place and puts it in line into a port on your router. So what we're effectively doing is making the network part of your solution. Each port on our router becomes a terabit scrubbing center, in line, line rate performance on that router. So instead of backhauling all that traffic over here, paying for all that scrubbing capacity and injecting it back in, we replicate that functionality in line on every port over here. So we think that's a very new innovation, and the only way really you can scale to terabit attacks is by making your network part of the problem, or part of the solution, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that goes either way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have a question about the, the scrubbing, right? So, I mean, this is an economics problem today. Yeah. But I mean, just like in all of networking and all of things, like obviously <laughs> as things scale up, as our capacity scales up, do you think that ep economic challenge remains five years from now? I think, I think it probably does. I mean, it's. Uh, the, the way I see the scrubbing center's price today, there is some erosion in there, but it's not eroding enough to handle a terabit attack. People are sizing for 100 gig, 200 gig attacks. They go over the top, they, if they, it goes over that, they go over the top to some security provider, super expensive, right? So my opinion is the only way to scale to a terabit attack t that we see today, what about a ten, ter 10 terabit attack tomorrow? The only way to really do that is to put it into the router. And by the way, if you put it into the router, we're protecting the peering edge, which is obvious, that's where a lot of, but what about if this was a data center here and we needed protection there? What about if it's subscribers coming in on this side, right? By making it part of the network, you're really building a full solution. And doing it this way, I'm not sure, I mean, we'll see, but I mean, we'll see if the industry ever gets there. Can you give us a sense of the pricing differential on using a scrubbing service when you need it versus buying custom silicon that's just gonna sit in a box and maybe you use it, maybe you don't? Yeah, the, the, cust the, the silicon is industry pricing. So you, you, you'll, there's, a, there's a licensing fee, but it's, I, in my opinion, I shouldn't say this live broadcasting. <laughs> it's a, it, there's no significant difference in the price of the silicon versus the industry, silicon, and you pick up all this stuff latently. So it's a, it's a dramatic price difference from just pricing this out. 